I could do that all day. Hi guys, how you doing? Nick Jennings from Guitar Interactive GI Plus. It's Monday evening. We're down here in the studio, as I'm sure you guys can probably tell. We're doing the thing that we do on Mondays, which is hang out and talk about the guitar. Hope you're doing really well. Today we're discussing uh, the act of not playing the guitar if that makes any sense. And what I mean by that is muting. Now, we're going to get into this in some detail as we go further on with our stream. But as usual with you guys, I want to take a quick moment and thank you for coming on board with the stream with us. It's always great to hang out and talk about the guitar with you guys. If you're enjoying what you're hearing, a couple of ways that you can help us keep the lights on metaphorically, literally, and physically, you can go to the link that is down here, which is uh, www.guitarinteractivemagazine.com forward slash GI hyphen plus, where you can go and get more lessons like this one, but in humongous detail. You've no idea. So many lessons in there. That's where we keep all the really, really good stuff. We've got loads of GI plus subscribers in our regular community of streamers always great to see you guys getting value out of what it is that we're doing over there it fills my heart with joy i love it right because i'm really proud of what we've created over the years also what you can do is you can give this video a thumbs up you can uh, share it with your guitar playing friends on whatever platform you're watching on and of course don't forget you can uh, also uh, drop us a comment down below. So if you have questions, if you have uh, comments, you've got anything you want to talk about, anything that's on your mind, you can drop us a comment. The algorithm loves comments, but more importantly, I love comments because I love to hear from you guys. So a couple of quick things as well. Before we get too far into this, obviously we're in the studio. Uh, studio setups are always a little bit hectic because we have a full days with the filming that we do, and then we get about 10 minutes to turn it around and turn it into a streaming setup. So uh, just a little peek behind the curtain for you guys. So let me know if you're hearing and seeing everything as you should. If you're getting all the audio nice and clear, uh, drop a comment down below and reassure me. We're gonna turn our attention to our little uh, comment section. We'll see how everybody's getting on. Let's see who was first in as well. We've got a few great comments coming in already. Uh, I have some questions for you guys, some little challenges. If you have your guitars ready, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, I guess, a little bit about your mutant technique, developing mutant technique. I'm going to ask you some questions about it as we go. Uh, Sacred God Slayer, first of all, uh, and Liam Tate uh, and PJ have said everything sounds fine. We are happy about this. That's good. Very, very nice. Chuffed with that. Okay, all good with sight and sound. Very, very cool. Excellent. Thank you so much for letting me know, guys. I appreciate it. You know that we have this little curse when we're down here in the studio. We have all this equipment available to us. We've got all this beautiful gear and this wonderful sounding and looking setup, and somehow we always manage to make a mess of the audio. So I'm very glad that it's sounding good. I'm chuffed with that. Again, uh, we turned this from a film studio into a streaming setup in zero time, so chuffed about that. Anyway, listen, let's turn our attention the stream. David Yates is first in the house, says, uh, hello Marcin, hello Nick and fellow guitar. I like that you're the first commenter and he still greeted Marcin, knowing that he would be right behind you. We love that. So anybody who's watching this the first time, we have a battle going on to be the first commenter on the stream. David Yates was almost two full hours ahead of the, uh, the start of the stream at 6.06 .06 p.m. David, it's great to see you. Uh, I always refer to David as Doreen Yates because I'm a meathead uh, and I mispronounce people's names. Uh, Marcin was second in the door at 6.09 p.m. Uh, PJ is in the house. PJ, it's great to see you. Uh, Sick God Slayer is in the house, says, uh, hi guys, hi Nick, a lesson about muting. Does it only work on guitars? Listen, I can't promise that this is going to work on people, if that's what you mean. Uh, we all have a few folks in our life that we'd like to put on mute, but unfortunately that is uh, beyond the realms of my powers. But it does definitely work on guitars. It works on other stringed instruments. Beyond that, that's kind of down to you. Anyway, Foghornish is in the house. Foghornish, is great to see you. Uh, Larry Warren is here. Larry, I love hearing about Larry's progress uh, with the stuff we're making, uh, stuff we're doing on these streams. Larry keeps making consistent week after week progress, and I love to hear about it. Uh, Cracker Tom is in the house. Uh, Hi all, like last week, I'm missing out, but uh, I will catch up on YouTube. Greetings from a uh, time out in sunny Malaga in Spain. Have a great time, I am jealous. But we're going to sunny California next week, so gonna be happy about that. But for the time being, we're just here in reasonably sunny London. Uh, anyway, Larry Warren says, uh, hey guys, how is everyone? Larry, I'm great, glad to have you on board. Timothy Appling, Timothy Appalling, as I keep referring to him, great punk band name, uh, says, hello Nick and fellow jammers, warmed up and ready to play, glad to hear it. Uh, Keith MOF is in the house, uh, heard Nuna Betancourt soloing our song, uh, on the song Rise today, uh, some playing, and no kidding, we have an interview with Nuna Betancourt, um, that will be coming out in a, an upcoming edition of Guitar Interactive Magazine. Keep your eyes peeled for that because uh, Jonathan Graham 
has got some, he's told me about it, I haven't seen it yet, but from, it sounds like he's got some phenomenal insights. I uh, hope that's not a spoiler, I might get in trouble for that, but who knows. Anyway, I'm sure not too much trouble, but yeah, keep your eyes peeled for that, it's great, or it sounds like it's going to be great. Mark McNish is in the house, says, hello Nick, hi everyone, I haven't changed strings for a while, <laughs> vintage tuners and high E string. I read that as vintage high E string, and I'm like, that's taken vintage gear to a whole new level, is uh, old school strings. Uh, vintage tuners and high E string uh, gave me some puncture wounds last night, Ugh. but uh, still ready to learn today. I have a very strange association with getting punctured with thin strings. I remember being a very young, a very young Nick, probably about maybe 13, I think I just started playing the guitar. I was very ill with like a flu or something like that. I can't 100% remember, but I remember trying to restring my guitar because I had nothing better to do. I was off school and I managed to puncture my finger and it's a very distinct sensation. It's painful and it's kind of slightly metallic at the same time. I can always kind of taste it. It's disgusting, but it, I always have that mental association when I puncture my finger of being ill as a child. It's weird, very, very strange. So sorry to hear that, but I'm sure you know, you've got tough enough calluses that it's not gonna cause you much of an issue because we know how much you guys practice. Uh, so 100% convinced that'll be fine. Uh, Cowcat says, hi people, very interesting topic and a question. Does Ingve play his arpeggios as muted chord shapes? That's a fabulous question. We're gonna star that up later or for later on. So you guys who have questions, right? Drop your questions down below because uh, we would love to hear from you, right? If you have questions about muting either now or at any point in the stream, or you have questions about anything else for that matter, let's keep it guitar related, um, drop it in the comments. We'll answer that later on in our hour together when we do our Q&A session. So yeah, there we go. Uh, Kim is in the house. Kim is literally uh, over, stood over there. I'm pointing at him right now. Uh, Kim is waving at everyone. Uh, so there we go. Rory Lisbon is in the house. Rory, it's great to see you. Rory's one of our more insightful streamers. Always has great stuff to add to the streams. Good to have you on board. Uh, Mark Crandall is here. Uh, hi, Nick. Hey, everybody. Chuffed to hear from you. Lots of comments saying the audio and the video is fine. Very, very uh, happy to hear that. He has a question. Uh, from uh, James Pond, 100 watt uh, a lamp, is it not too height? Um, I'm guessing you mean amplifier, right? Uh, I, I'm assuming 100 watt amplifiers, well, I've got one here and I've got one here and I like them just fine, but we're gonna, we're gonna start that up. We'll talk about amp wattage a little bit later on. I'm assuming you don't mean light bulbs because I'm the wrong person to ask about that, but if you mean an amplifier, we'll find out about that. Uh, Daryl Queen is in the house. Uh, Daryl, it's great to see you. Uh, Marcin says, will there be a stream next week? There will be a stream next week. Uh, who is presenting the stream? I can't tell you, but there will be a stream next week. Yeah, we always stream over now weekend, but you know what that stream is going to look like, I'm not going to tell you just yet. Don't forget, by the way, if you have questions, drop your questions down below. Uh, Dmax is a very young me, uh, could both high E strings and a 12 string. Uh, and wound, uh, wound up with them piercing the top and bottom of my wrist. Ouch, that sounds very painful. Uh, very, very painful indeed, yeah. Not pleased to hear that. So anyway, listen, let's get stuck into the, uh, the muting thing. We're getting to the meat of today's session. Uh, muting, what is it, what is it not? So this is the strangest thing to sit and talk to people about when it comes to streaming uh, <laughs> guitar lessons because muting is, by its very definition, not something you can hear. So it's something that we have to try and demonstrate without actually being able to give you an audible example. But I think that's kind of part of the fun here. So uh, let's talk about it. So muting is the act of, it kind of comes in two forms. It is the act of stopping notes ringing out that we don't want to ring out, i.e. if we play the G string, let's go to the close-up cam real quick. If we play the G string, we mute to stop the other strings from ringing. Now you wouldn't think this would be too much of a problem because if you play the piano, for example, and you play middle C, you wouldn't expect C sharp and B and B flat next to it to ring out. But the guitar has, uh, it, it wants to get involved. You play one string, all the other strings want to get involved. And I think that's because it's quite a small and quite a resonant instrument, and we're playing it with a percussive act. If you, just very quickly, if your guitar's plugged in, just try this with me together, right? I want you to fret a note, and rather than picking that note, just knock on the neck of your guitar a little bit like this. We can hear, there it goes again, we can hear all those strings want to get involved, ringing in sympathy, and even though we're only fretting one of the notes, 
we can get sympathetic vibrations from all of our other strings. This becomes a problem, especially when we use compression and distortion on the guitar. So we want to stop those things from happening, and that's where our muting comes in. But in addition to that, muting is also being able to cleanly control the duration of a note. So the duration of your note is something that people don't really spend a lot of time thinking about when it comes to their improvising, certainly, but when it comes to playing their solos, we think about the uh, starting our note at the right time, for example, and we think about playing the right notes, bending them to the right pitch. If you're a regular streamer or a well-educated guitar player, a well-traveled guitar player, you'll think about, is the vibrato right? Am I doing vibrato at all? Is the touch right? Is the tone right? Am I on the right pickup selection, all that stuff? But something we rarely give too much credence to is, how do we control how long our note is in time? Let me throw a different backing track on for you very quickly. Uh, we've been playing our modern metal backing track because that's one I was uh, messing around with before. But let's do this one instead. Let's do uh, one of our uh, slightly more sedate backing tracks. We'll do the ambient ballad in e, ma e major, which is one of my favorites. What I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna play some notes and I'm not gonna pay any attention to the duration of my notes. And then I'm gonna start finally controlling the duration, i.e. how long does the note go for, when do I stop it, and how cleanly do I stop it? And then we'll see what's going on with that. PJ has a great question regarding upstroke escape. Uh, for those of you who don't know, um, the upstroke escape strategy is something we discuss in Picking Strategies Part 1. It's a course that's available in GI+. We're gonna uh, answer that question probably sooner rather than later, PJ. I'll definitely try and get to it uh, in the Q&A if I don't. Uh, get to, to do it in the bulk of today's session, but I think we'll definitely get that answered sooner rather than. So some duration stuff very quickly, right? So uh, very quickly, let's go to the close-up cam. Let's not go to an empty camera slot. We're gonna go to this close-up cam. Uh, if I play this, this is our backing track. This is our ambient ballad. If I were to play some stuff with no real attention to how long my notes are, hugely pleasing. Now, I'm exaggerating this for comedic effect, but the note duration, when we start to focus our attention on that, we go from something like that to something a bit more like this. Not that note, that was terrible. This is where our string muting comes in and becomes a musical effect as much as a noise control effect. Because what I'm doing here is I'm paying attention to uh, when I'm closing the note, if you want to call it that, when we're cutting the note off, how cleanly I'm able to do it, how I'm doing it, whether I'm you know leaving the note to uh, to just kind of like to, to, to die into feedback, or whether I'm cutting it short, whether I'm sliding off, etc. how long that slide is. All of this stuff we discussed in a previous live stream where we discussed uh, like kind of the ending of notes. That's another story for another day. But the important thing with this is with my muting technique, I'm able to end notes in a way that is rhythmically coherent. Now we'll discuss that in a bit, but before we do that, I've got some uh, questions for you, right? What I want you to do is I want you to play the following for me. We're gonna play some notes in our G major scale. Let's start with uh, the G major scale here. I'm gonna go to the close-up cam and show you myself on there as well. So if we play fret three, five, seven, and then on the next two strings, three, five, seven, Sorry, next string, three, five, seven. On the middle two strings, four, five, seven, four, five, seven. 
And then on the next two strings, five, seven, eight, five, seven, eight. Here's a little challenge. I'm gonna turn that delay off because it's a bit annoying. We'll come back to the delay. Uh, I have my cortex right down here so I can tap on it, which is cool. Um, what I wanna know from you is I want to know, are you able to transition from string to string when you play this and have each string be the only string that's sounding? And when you do it, how are you achieving that? Let me know in the comments, what is, what is it that you think you're doing to make these strings stop ringing when it's time to move to the next string? Let me show you what I'm talking about. So if we make no effort to mute when we move from string to string, we might get this. Not a very pleasing sound, I'm sure you'll agree. If we mute our strings effectively, we might get something like this. Now you guys know that I like an awful lot of gain, as I'm sure you can hear. Let's find a backing track that we can play along together on this. If we go to our big hair E Aeolian, uh, we should be able to play along quite nicely with this. Uh, we're going to do this together, and I want to know if you're able to mute this cleanly at a variety of tempos, and how it is that you're achieving it. We're going to start by picking every note, but then we'll also discuss legato technique. So, if we begin here... That's quite good fun. Let's go to our close-up cam. We know the scale, G major scale. Let's go like this. Let's try it together. Can you meet it cleanly? Ready, here we go. A one, two, three, four. That's pretty good. Let's go a little faster. Let's do it in triplets. That's about as fast as we need to go, so let's try it together. Ready? Uh, one, two, three, four. And again, here we go. And again. Now let's go a little slower. Let's go again. One, two, three, four. That's probably enough experimentation with that. So we should have some data that we can operate on here. Those of you who are playing along with this, which hopefully is gonna be all of you guys, I wanna know, can you play this without kind of creating extra noise, without there being all these strings ringing out as we go? And if you, do, if you can do it, how are you achieving that? What are you doing to make this happen? This kind of falls into a few different camps, but we'll discuss that, right? So uh, we've got some comments coming in already. Uh, Don Gola has a comment regarding notifications. Don, thank you for pointing that out. Um, we're gonna address that thing because uh, Don says he loves these sessions. Don, we love having you on these sessions. So we're gonna address that. Thank you so much for bringing that to our attention. Uh, okay, Liam Tate says palm muting going up the scale and then fret hand muting on the way back down. That's really interesting. So here's a question for you, Liam. Uh, on the way back down, are you doing anything with your palm to stop the strings that you're about to play from ringing out as we play, or is it just left hand beating as we go? We'll, we'll address that. And likewise, is there any left hand beating going on on the way up? It's an interesting question. Falk Hornish says, for me, uh, a combination of slight palm beating, but also barely fretting the note. Now, that's an interesting interesting thing. I'm guessing that's barely fretting the note in the sense of uh, fretting quite lightly, but also grazing the string that we uh, we don't want to play. Um, PJ says, ooh, a bit of, uh, ooh, a bit of left hand uh, finger muting with thumb and middle fingers on the right hand and occasional side of right hand. Very interesting indeed. Now, um, these are all viable strategies that we're gonna get into in a minute. Uh, Liam says, yes, I am. Cool, pleased to hear it. David Yates says, I can indeed, same as Liam. That's cool. Uh, Keith MOF says, palm muting at slower speeds, bit mushy when speeding up. That's interesting, so we'll address that in a second. Uh, okay, 
That's another question, by the way. Does anybody have more difficulty with this when we start to get faster, or is it even and consistent as we go? So those of you guys who have uh, no trouble either at slow speeds or fast speeds, let me know. If it starts to get a bit mushy, uh, as Keith has pointed out, as we get faster, then we'll address that too. Okay, next question. Same thing, but this time legato. Let's see how that treats us. So same deal, but all hammer-ons and pull-offs this time. Close-up camera. Here we go. Let's start kind of slow. Let's go. Let's try that together. Ready? A one, two, a one, two, three, four. That's good, let's speed it up. Let's go like this. Ready? Here we go. Uh, one, two, three, four. And again, here we go. And one more time. Everyone still okay with that? Let's go a bit faster. Let's go like this. Now don't worry if that's a bit too fast for you. That's fine. But let's go together. A one, two, a one, two, three, four. And again, one, two, three, four. Okay, that's probably enough experimentation there. So those of you guys who uh, did this successfully or unsuccessfully. I want to hear from you if you can't do this as well. Uh, if you did it successfully or unsuccessfully on one, uh, without picking, let me know if it was any different with legato because some people find it different. Uh, we're going to address all these techniques, by the way. This is just some diagnosis, but uh, diagnosis burger. Um, is it any different when we do legato? Because there's some interesting stuff that happens when we do legato technique that might be more noise producing let's say, but we're gonna get to that. So we've got some other things coming in here. Uh, Foghorn is just an interesting point. Uh, it says, uh, I used to pinch my daughter's Peppa Pig's hair, Peppa Pig hair bands to cheat and put it just in front of the nuts, uh, but they don't make those fluffy kinds anymore. Still got a few vintage ones to go with our vintage E strings. Um, Sacred God Slayer uh, rightly points out, uh, buy some, I always thought this was pronounced Grove Gear, but it's Groove Gear. Uh, buy some Groove Gear stuff. Yeah, fret wraps are cool. Um, I don't use fret wraps because of a few reasons. Um, first of all, I'm kind of stubborn, uh, but secondly, they don't really fit on Paul Reed Smith headstocks terribly well. So I could use a headband. Fret wraps are a little bit too big to go at this, like this part of my headstock. They don't quite fit there, just a little bit too thick. Uh, so that's a bit of a pain. Um, but we have some comments coming in. Daryl uh, Queen has a very interesting one. Uh, says, the flat of my index finger on the fretting hand is doing a lot of the muting work. Very interesting indeed. Now, okay, here's a question. Let's talk about muting strategies and what's available to us. So when it comes to muting uh, strings, we have kind of two sets of strings we need to deal with. We have to deal with strings this side, Let's go to the close-up cam. This side of the note we're playing and strings this side of the note we're playing. Now, strings this side of the note we're playing will usually be dealt with. Ah, the small groove. I didn't know they made a small one. Right, there you go. I'm going to get some because, you know, sometimes when you're recording, yeah, you just kind of, a, a bit of help helps. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Instru Here's another thing, by the way. Quick question, ph philosophy for you guys. Is using tools like a fret wrap, where we, uh, is, is that cheating, right? I wanna know in the car, I have my own thoughts, right? Is it cheating if you use a fret wrap or something similar to help with muting? Is that cheating, right? We'll get to that. Got a good question in from Cowcat that we'll address in a minute, but okay, as far as string muting goes and string muting strategies, uh, strings this side of our, our note, i.e. lower than our note, is normally taken care of with some kind of skin from the palm or the thumb side of our, uh, our right hand. 
strings on this side, right, on this side, is uh, normally taken care of with some kind of skin from our left hand. I say normally because there are other strategies that are available to us. Uh, Liam Tate says it's not cheating. Uh, the original instrument design is flawed. Yeah, for sure. The guitar is a very badly designed instrument, right? I've said this for, for a number of years. It's a very badly designed instrument because, I mean, let's, let us count the ways. First of all, okay, let's compare it to a piano. <laughs> so a piano, uh, everything feels nice. The keys are all smooth. They're all in a line. They're color coded. Um, you get to use all 10 fingers uh, at the same time and your feet. It's very cool. Uh, the guitar, you have to wear it, which is annoying. Um, so it's heavy. You have to reserve your most dexterous hand for hitting the thing. Uh, you have to press sharp bits of metal or hard bits of metal or rough bits of metal onto other bits of metal to make the sound. If you do it slightly wrong, it'll sound weird. Uh, if you press a key in slightly the wrong place in the piano, you're fine. Um, it, it also, like, it's six overlapping monophonic instruments tuned in fourths apart from these two which are tuned in uh, a major third because the Spanish thought it was cool uh, and it is cool because we get to play ACDC uh, like this but <laughs> at the same time it's a terribly designed instrument but we get to do this and also this So the human voice doesn't get to do this. Pianos can't do this. Saxophones can't do this. Violins can't do that to any great extent. This is one of the things that makes it cool. We also get to run it through effects pedals and uh, it looks cool as well. It's, it's, it's affordable, it's portable and you get to do this with it. Um, so yeah, guitar's a terribly designed instrument, but it's also the best instrument in the world. Uh, regarding cheating, I'm going to take a tangent and talk about cheating with fret wraps. Uh, fret wraps are okay for performance, bad for practice. I like the way you think, young man. Very. I don't know if you're a young man, but I like the way you think. Uh, so yeah, for sure. Uh, Marcin says, if it's cheating, then using digital portable rigs are cheating as well. That's an interesting perspective. Daryl Queen says, it isn't cheating uh, as long as you don't use it as an excuse not to work on mutant technique or approaches. Uh, Mark McNish says, sometimes I'm just sick of hearing the noise when I'm practicing. Uh, anything that improves playing is a bonus. I don't think it's cheating. Uh, I don't really use them anymore though because you can't do open harmonics and dive bombs, etc. I think that's really interesting. Uh, probably right. Uh, MAB, only allowed to use a fret wrap <laughs> when using four neck guitars and both hands and doing hammer-ons. Uh, I will also make exceptions for guys like uh, TJ Helmerich or Chris Broderick doing all that stuff with distortion. Here's the deal, right? Uh, you, cheating implies the breaking of rules, right? If you are cheating, you are either breaking a rule or you're breaking some kind of agreement. Uh, it is agreed that you're gonna do things a certain way and you, you, you don't do it for your benefit. Um, there are no rules when it comes to make, playing the guitar. It's not a sport. So you, by definition, cannot cheat at playing the guitar. You can deceive people. Um, so like, you know, the fake guitar epidemic it can be deceptive. Is it cheating? I don't think that's a word that we can use in our guitar discussion because it's not it's not a competitive sport, if that makes sense. So I don't think it's cheating. Um, I don't use them, but a couple of things. First of all, I didn't know you can get one that fit the PRS. And I don't think they look that cool, if that makes sense. I think they kind of look a bit lame. But at the same time, I mean, hey, everyone likes different things. You know, uh, a lot of people in the YouTube comments don't like my big hairy knees. So uh, who am I to talk about? Uh, speeding up videos might be considered cheating. I would consider that deceptive. I wouldn't consider it cheating, but I would consider it deceptive uh, uh, and poor business practice. Uh, anyway, so muting strategies that are available to us. Let's talk about muting uh, notes that are lower than the one we're playing. So we're playing the G string. We can mute the other strings in a number of different ways. And this is where our picking preferences become uh, interesting because depending upon where you are with your picking preferences, whether you prefer a downstroke escape, an upstroke escape, or whether you use some combination of the two or something else will determine what your muting is going to look like. So, uh, for example, um, our friend PJ uh, mentioned an upstroke escape picking uh, preference uh, and muting being a challenge. Muting can be a challenge with upstroke escape. Uh, so, here's what we can do. We can mute with the skin of our right hand. 
that's going to work just fine. What I would suggest with this as well though, is that you also have the option to mute lower pitch strings using just a tiny bit of overlap from your first, second, third, and or fourth fingers. So, um, for example, uh, if we uh, were to play the G string, let's do this together, right? So grab your U guitars, we're gonna play the G string. What I want you to do is I want you to strike the D and G strings together. And I wanna see if you can position your first finger in such a way that it dampens down the D string. So we get that sound as opposed to that sound without having to resort to right hand muting, which is gonna give us this. I'm gonna quickly highlight this by the way, Daryl Queen with the comment of the century. Uh, the only thing, the one thing you can cheat is yourself uh, of a growth opportunity uh, and that dopamine rush of overcoming an obstacle. You win the internet for the day, right? That is a great comment and suitably positive. That's a really great outlook uh, on this sort of stuff. I, I applaud you, great comment, very, very good. So anyway, um, let's see if we can do that together. Let's see if we can play our G string and use our first finger as a, a muting tool. Now here's the thing, you don't actually need to keep it permanently in contact with the string to make this work. Because what happens when you pick your D string, if you pay close attention to what's going on here, the D string will move into contact with your finger through the act of picking the thing. So we don't need permanent contact here, but we can get a little sweet spot where we can fret with our first finger and also mute the, uh, the D string. So that's another option for us. So what we need to do is we can use some combination of palm muting and also first finger muting. You can also do second finger muting, all that sort of stuff. That will work just fine. There are some options. Now, other options that we can use are uh, for muting the strings this side of our, uh, our, our intended note. We can use, for the most part, the flat of our fingers to dampen that down. So if we play here, let's say we fret our fifth fret on the G string, we should be able to use our fingers to flatten down the notes on the B and E strings so that if we were to strum from the G string down over, we could get just the G string. Now, this is a fun thing to practice, right? It's a fun thing to practice. And a way that you could practice it is you could throw a backing track on you could play on a single string and experiment with how many strings you're strumming or striking at the same time. So what we may do is we may play something like this, where we might play on our G string, straight frets four, five, seven, and we could play the G string on its own. Then we could play the G string and B string together, but trying to mute the B string. Not the easiest thing in the world. Let's do that together one more time. So G string on its own. G and B strings. Let's do G and D strings together, but trying to make only the G string come out. Not the easiest thing in the world. Sounds like the Libertines. I will not be able to unhear that now. You're absolutely right, it does. Uh, let's do it to our backing track. So let's try playing. Just in our G string. Now let's play G and B strings and try and mute the B string. Let's do D and G strings, try and mute the D string. If we can do that and we have an effective muting technique, then we're pretty good because the strings that we're most in danger of fretting are the ones uh, that, that we're most in danger of getting noise from, or the ones that are either side of the string we're playing on. So if we can mute those effectively, we are good. Let's pose another challenge with that then. With that in mind, uh, let's address muting and skipping strings because this is where a lot of people get a bit messed up. Now in the past I've talked about 
quite facetiously, uh, I guess, like, why is string skipping a thing? You know, why is it some special technique to not play strings that are adjacent to each other? Uh, there's no law that says we have to play, if we're playing on the G string, we must go to the D string or the B string. Why is going from the G string to an E string a special technique? <laughs> It's more just an organization strategy than anything, but this can also pose muting challenges. So here's a question for you. We're gonna play the following. We're gonna go back to our, um, our scale example, and this time we're gonna play the low E string, the G string, and the high E string. Low E, G, high E, and we'll get this. <laughs> Quite apart from how much we sound like Paul Gilbert, this is going to present a muting challenge for us. Now, those of you who are able to do this muting thing very, very easily, I want to see if you can do this with this string skip and see if it presents any more issues for you. So, let's do it together. Here we go. Ready? Let's go. Ready? A one, two, three, four. Let's do it again. A one, two, a one, two, three, four. And let's not stop this time. Let's keep going round and round. Are you able to make this work? And are you putting any of the notes short like this? I want to know, are you able to make that work? Are you having to make any changes? And are you cutting any of the notes short during the transitions? Let me know in the comments because there's another thing to deal with there. Let's speed it up and let's go like this. Let's go. Can we still get it clean? Let's go faster again, let's go. Are you running into, into any problems while you do this? Now I've chosen something deliberately quite hard to play here. So if you're struggling with this leg, don't worry. This is interesting. It's good if you're struggling with this leg because it's going to highlight some tendencies in your own playing. Now, in my experience, here's a good question from Timothy Appling or a good comment from Timothy Appling saying, uh, a lot easier to mute the B string than the D string because the fingers cover the B string. Uh, oh, regarding, okay, that's regarding our previous example. Sure, I, I totally agree with you, totally agree with you. Uh, that's a stretch, uh, says Liam, that is a bit of a stretch. Uh, <laughs> PJ says, I can do it, but sort of. Going down the scale can't always stop the sympathetic string noise. Uh, yeah, I think that's reasonable. Keith MOF says, mushy. These are common complaints, right? So I've chosen something that's quite hard here, right? it's quite difficult. Um, so. Common complaints here, what people tend to do is they tend to either undermute or overmute. Uh, and by overmute, what I mean is we might end up with something like this. Where things get a bit too muted and we end up palm muting notes that we don't want to palm mute in an effort to, uh, to, to reduce our noise. We get a bit too overzealous with it. Another issue that people might have is they may be under mute and don't quite mute enough to get all this stuff happening. Let me show you some tricks that I'm using for this, right? First of all, don't be afraid to get your right hand fingers involved in the muting process, right? If I'm going like this, look at where my, uh, these two fingers are, right here. Where are they? They're on the high E string, right? Don't be afraid of that. John Petrucci does this, it's just fine, right? So if I go like this, Yeah, I can't always get the high strings to mute properly 
when I'm way down here on my low strings, especially if I'm coming from the high strings straight away. If I do it without touching the high strings with my middle fingers on this hand, I get this. It can be very challenging for me to catch those notes effectively enough. So what I'll do instead is I'll use some of the fingers from my right hand just to touch the string very gently. This also frees up my right hand to be a little bit more mobile. Now that's another thing with this. When it comes to muting, we don't need to press very hard on the strings. We don't need to press very hard on the strings to make the muting happen. Our muting can be very gentle. Let's do an experiment, right? I want you to play me an A chord. Let's do a G chord, in fact. G chords are good. Let's do a G chord, G for good. Uh, I wanna see how much force we need to mute the strings. Let's see how gently we can do this. So if we go like this. How much force do we need? Not a lot, right? Not a great deal. Here's another thing though. Can you actually mute all of the strings with a karate chop? Or do you find that your fingers or your palm doesn't quite cover all of the strings? Let's try it. Sort of, sort of. Now, when it comes to, uh, to our muting, what we tend to do when we get a bit nervous about our muting is we clamp down on the strings really, really hard. We don't want to do that. We want to mute with a very, very gentle touch. We want to just soothe the string to rest rather than like shut it up with force, right? Think about it like that. Think about it as a master cue of just like sh gently shushing the string, right? Shush it to rest. You've done your job now, little string, you know, shush. As opposed to shut up. Uh, we don't really want that. So that's gonna lead to a bunch of other issues. But as far as the muting thing with fingers goes, here's another cool trick with that. Another instance where noise can creep into our playing is in bending and vibrato. Let's do some bends on our G string, we're gonna do a tone bend from D to E. And let's give it some big vibrato. What I want you to do is play the bend and then waggle that vibrato without any muting from your right hand and see what happens. Like this. Sounds like an earthquake's coming on. Let's do it again. Now, that's not a great sound, so what do we do? We mute the strings that we're trying not to, to play on, but if we're bending properly, we can't really get, uh, we can't really get the, um, the fingers to partake in muting of the treble strings. This is especially problematic if we're doing pole vibrato like this. <laughs> because the fingers are even touching the strings there. It's not really a very effective method of muting. So what do we do? We use this little tunnel method where we take either the tip of our thumb, we don't have to get rid of the pick for this, you can just do it like this, or the palm of our right hand, rest that on the lower strings, use the fingers of your right hand to mute the upper strings, which gives us this. <laughs> That's a fantastic trick for making your uh, vibrato nice and clean. So big bends, big vibrato, don't be afraid to get your fingers involved either side of the muting. Now here's one last thing when it comes to legato technique. Now we mentioned that legato was a, uh, a, a, a maybe a problematic technique as far as noise goes. Here's the deal, right? What I want you to do is I want you to do the following experiment with me, right? Let's take our low E string and let's play some hammer-ons and pull-offs like this. On the low E string. On three, five, seven. In fact, let's put it in a slightly less stretchy place. Let's put it in five, seven, uh, and then 10. Sorry, let's say that again. Seven, eight, and 10. Let's play there. What I want you to do here is I want you to take your thumb and rest it on the low E string so the low E string doesn't make any noise. Listen to how much noise just hammering on and pulling off can make uh, when it comes to your, uh, your other strings ringing out. Listen to this. Even strings I don't touch.
want to get involved. Why? Because when we hammer on, what are we doing? We're slamming the string forcefully onto a fret. That's no different to doing this. Especially on other strings like this. Like, you can hear those other strings wanting to get involved in the movement. Now, part of the issue with this is when we get too forceful with our hammer-ons and pull-offs, when we really get a bit too aggressive, especially with hammer-ons, we can introduce more noise sheerly by the dint of the fact that we're slamming on the neck of the guitar really hard. It's already a resonant piece of wood. So what we might do is we might pay some attention to not creating that noise in the first place by working on the lightness of our hammer-ons. Now, we've done some streams on legato technique. That's a valuable thing. But when you're doing legato, you also don't need to be as on it with your picking because we're not picking as much. You need to be able to play cleanly and pick where you need to. But this is a good opportunity to also then employ that finger mute technique. Let me show you what I mean. So if I'm playing legato... <laughs> I think it sounds volume all the way up so the noise gate doesn't get me. One of the things I'm doing to employ, uh, it's twofold actually, it's a little trick. One of the things I'm doing is I am uh, using my thumb and, <laughs> pardon me, my middle and ring fingers to dampen down the strings out of the side of the one I'm playing, but this also gives me the fringe benefit of always having a finger ready to do hybrid picking. Now, we've done streams on hybrid picking, and we've talked about how um, your legato technique can be uh, enhanced by hybrid picking. That's not the subject for the day, but that is 100% something to consider. So when you're doing legato, and you want to keep your legato nice and clean, what we can do is we can employ this little, uh, I guess you'd call it the tunnel mute, where we create a little tunnel for the string that we want to sound with the fingers of our right hand and also the right hand thumb and skin. There are some other strategies that are available to us, uh, which we may talk about in a second, but that little tunnel is very, very effective because it means if we accidentally graze a string that we don't want, it's very unlikely to come out, but we, don't all, we then also don't need to worry about dedicating the skin from our left hand to muting strings, which is something that we can do when we're picking because the left hand demands are not quite so much. And it also means if you want to activate the string that your finger's on, you just do that with it because I'll do that again. So if I'm muting the E string like this, I'll turn the guitar up. If I want an E string note, I'm already on the E string with my middle finger. If I now want a B string note, I'm on the B string with my pick already. Here I've moved, so I'm already on the G string with my pick. I'm already on the E string, this time with my ring finger. So my hybrid picking technique, by doing that, has also become uh, an extension of our muting technique, which I think is really cool. Now, as far as note duration goes, here's a quick one. Uh, I want to see if we can terminate our notes rhythmically in a cogent place. We've talked a lot about muting today. We're going to answer some questions in a bit, but let's throw our back and track back on. Let's play some notes. What I want to do is I want to make each note last exactly at this speed three beats. Let's go like this. So if we go like this on our G string, let's start down here. We're going to play our string again. Let's go one, two, three. 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 Off. One, two, three. Off. One, two, three. Off. Now, 
That might have been more difficult than you maybe first imagined, controlling that note duration, because a couple of things can happen. First of all, when we dampen our note uh, with this, we're lifting our finger off, but we're also keeping the finger in contact with the string to mute the note that we've just played and cut it short. But doing this with rhythmic control, rather than just letting it happen whenever, that's an interesting thing in of itself. Let's do it again, but let's keep the notes the same, but we'll make each one one beat in length, exactly one beat in length. So we'll go one off. Let's go like this. Here we go, let's go. One off, two. One off. One off. One off, three, four. One off, three, four. One off, three, four. One off. That makes sense? Developing an awareness of your note duration is going to improve not only your ability to, to play connected, but it's also going to improve your musicality when you start getting into your improvisation practice with this stuff because note duration, as we demonstrated earlier on, very, very underrated skill, but it's one that definitely is one of those things that separates the players who can really play from uh, players who maybe need a little bit more time with the instrument. Um, so very, very interesting. Now, we're gonna go to our Q&A, but before we do, for those who are interested, uh, if you wanna spend a bit more time developing a picking technique, muting is included in this, by the way. Uh, we definitely touch on muting with this, not quite to the detail that we've done in this stream, uh, but uh, I would encourage you to check out this course. This is Picking Strategies Part One. It is our big, in-depth, deep dive into all things picking. Keep an eye on this, because there's some discussion of picking techniques. We're gonna answer PJ's question with regards to muting with an upwards uh, escape strategy, because uh, that's a very good question and pertinent to our course. But let me show you this. When we come back, we'll do a little bit of Q&A. So for the meantime, picking strategy. <laughs> Does your picking feel uncoordinated and sometimes you miss notes or fluff transitions from string to string, maybe a little bit like this? When in reality what you want is smooth and easy and transparent feeling picking, a bit like this. Or maybe you've been sold on the idea that there's one specific way that you have to pick on the guitar and everything else is wrong, but that particular cookie cutter approach just doesn't work for you. It feels unnatural. It almost feels like you're fighting your own body to try and make it work. Well, Picking Strategies Part 1 is the course for you. In this course, we explore the many different ways that you can form a full and complete and comprehensive picking approach by examining the various strategies used by some of the greatest pickers of all time. And there are a whole bunch of strategies out there, and I guarantee there is one that is gonna work for your preferred picking mechanics, the way you prefer to stand or sit with the guitar, the type of guitar you play, the type of music you play, there is a strategy for you. We're gonna explore all of them and I'm gonna show you how you can take a single solo study and play every line within it using all of the six picking strategies that we look at in this course. And of course, this entire course is available as part of your GI Plus membership. So if you're not signed up already, what better excuse do you need to sign up today? So there you go guys, that's Picking Strategies Part 1, let's go to you. 
the Q&A, kaboom. If you've got questions, we still got time to answer them, so drop your comments down below if you have anything that you want to talk about. Uh, I, I always forget how much of a flex that solo is at the end of that trailer. Uh, it was just me going like, hey, how fast can I play and still have it be cogent? Woo, quite something. Um, so yeah, quite chuffed for that, but it's very much like, it's pretty show offy, but hey, you know what it is, those strategies, if you want to get there, it's what got me there, so don't see why, uh, why you would be any different. Anyway, listen, so some great questions coming in. I want to address this one now. Um, it's already been answered in the comments, but Brain Dog is asking the question uh, of, uh, is there a right or wrong position of the right hand, like near the bridge or close to the neck humbucket? Uh, and discussion was made of like, um, palm muting. I think you guys were kind of crosswires with each other. It's kind of all being sorted now anyway, but to address that, uh, there's a right place to do palm muting. It's generally best to have it uh, down by the bridge, but the position of the hand in your palm mute can radically change the sound of the palm mute. Now, as Sacred God Slayer rightly points out, um, the uh, palm muting too close to the neck pickup can change the intonation of the string. Let me demonstrate it very quickly for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about. So palm muting is this, where we dampen the strings at the bridge. We would, pro I think muting is probably the wrong name for it. It probably should be called palm dampening but because we don't mute the note, we don't make it silent, we just dampen it so it goes from this to this. Now, we should as guitar players have a range of palm mute that's available to us. Starting from a very light palm mute. That's almost no palm mute at all, through to a more aggressive palm mute. But still has a bit of crunch in the note to it, through to a really aggressive, very dead sounding palm mute. All the way through to that kind of like, which is more percussion than note. And you achieve that by microscopically sliding the hand to and from the bridge. So if it's right just, so it's just touching the saddle. And almost coloring the note, but not quite. That'd be a very light palm mute. That's actually really useful for picking runs. So if I play it. A very light palm mute can really help with that. Whereas if we play with a very aggressive palm mute, nothing comes out. It just becomes Whereas if we're playing like chugga da chugga da riffy stuff, like we may want a more aggressive palm mute. And there's colors in between those two. So, you know, we're gonna slide around for that. But as far as the intonation goes, if we go too far, towards the, uh, the, the neck part of the guitar, what we end up with is we end up with the hand, the palm of the hand becoming a new, albeit very soft, bridge saddle, which changes the intonation of the, the string. And we get this. Doesn't sound great, but it can change the intonation. Now, as far as the palm meeting goes, that's the thing, as far as tone goes, I don't think there is a right place. I think it depends upon what you're trying to achieve. What you may want is you may want to move further towards the bridge for a brighter tone, further towards the neck for a, uh, a slightly warmer or thicker tone. I think this is all part of your individual sound and your individual taste and all that sort of stuff. But it also um, depends on the layout of the guitar. So for me, I tend to play a lot closer to the bridge on this guitar because of the position of the volume knob. It's a little less comfortable for me to play here than it is to play here, or I'll play like way over here, over the neck pickup, because I'm out of the way of the volume knob. On some of my stop tail PRS, which have more of a big uh, pronounced drop from this forearm concert to the bridge, what I'll do there is I'll play a little bit closer to the where the middle pickup would be. Again, it's all preference, but you get a different tone depending upon where you are. So if I play here, for example, versus here, We 
get different tones. Here's another fun thing though. The strings are tighter back here than they are over here. So if you need a bit more string resistance for a particular technique, like picking, for example, like... <laughs> You may want to pick a bit closer to the bridge. If you want a bit less string resistance, for example, like uh, like raking the strings in the Steve Ray Vaughan thing, totally the wrong sound to do that on. That may be better. Not great to do that on the big metal distortion, but you get the idea. Um, that might be better over here because the strings are a bit looser, so you don't encounter the same tiring tension when you batter through the strings. So if you want to bounce off the strings, you might be better off here, but if you want to plow through them, you may, you may be better off here. Uh, so it's a very good question, Brain Dog, and one that doesn't get talked about enough, I don't think, but a very good question. Okay, more questions, more questions as we go. Uh, David Yates, uh, <laughs> here's a question. Marcin, man, that app sounds good. Marcin, that's really kind of you. Uh, we're not plugged into an app, but thank you. We're using the Cortex, if you can believe that, right? We've been using this for videos all day and we didn't want to move it out of the way. Uh, but this is the Victory um, uh, Super Sheriff. It does sound amazing. We're using a, a capture of my Super Kraken. Um, so it sounds really close, it's very similar. Uh, so I agree it does sound great, but thanks man, I appreciate that. But that's the Cortex. The modelers are coming for us. Who knew? Yeah, but you know, it's pretty close. Uh, David Yates, uh, Warren Dimitini and George Lynch were great for muting in their solos. It was all the rage back in the 80s, along with Farah Trousers. Uh, it sure was, and it was uh, almost like a flex to say, look how clean my playing is. There's no fluff, you just hear every attack. Um, it's a cool sound, so if we play here, if we go back to our uh, 80s back track, I'll treat myself to some delay. What we might get is this sort of thing. If you'd normally play... We mute it. It's very 80s. And then again, if we do like big long runs, if we play it clean with no muting. And then we palm mute. It sounds really 80s and like, like you say, very, uh, very George Lynch, very, um, uh, very Warren, very Paul Gilbert. Uh, also, if we do the mute legato thing, we play legato notes and we mute. Everybody associates that with Rick Graham. Rick does it phenomenally well. It's Nuno. He said, hey, Satan of God Slayer said the same thing. It's Nuno. Uh, it's Nuno. Uh, 100%, right? Uh, the 80s were great, says David Yates. I mean, we got to wear more interesting trousers as well. Uh, but yeah, there was some phenomenal guitar players in the 80s. I grew up in that stuff. I was a huge 80s guitar uh, nut when I was a, a little and uh, I say little when I was in my 20s. Okay, more questions. So, um, here's an interesting one. So, uh, Cowcat says, uh, question is, if players do mute lower strings by their choosing style or because they can't keep all the value of notes? Uh, now, that's an interesting one because if you're doing it out of style, rock on. Uh, if you're even doing it without noticing it and you like the sound of it, rock on. But I would urge you to be able to control uh, whether you're muting on the low notes or not, or whether you're, you know, when you're muting your notes. I think control over that is very important. Uh, and then you can choose to do it. If you like the style, if you like the sound of it, go for it. If it sounds good, it's good. Um, you know, the Van Halen thing there. <laughs> Incidentally, that muted legato thing, Eddie doesn't get enough credit for that, because Eddie was the guy who started doing that. <laughs> Yes, it's Nuno, but it's also Eddie. Uh, and Nuno would agree with that. You know, Nuno's a huge Eddie fan. Um, so yes, uh, 100%. Okay, PJ, I have an upstroke escape neck, so my palm muting is nigh on impossible. Any thoughts are oh, much appreciated. Yes, got some thoughts for you. I promise we'd answer this, so we're gonna go into this. Even though we've run a bit late, uh, we're gonna go into this. So, uh, 
Open Escape uh, implies that we are using, for those who don't know, using this bone of the forearm right here in contact with the guitar's body. This bone of the forearm is not. Uh, so we're here. This means that our downstrokes will bury into the strings. Our upstrokes will pull away. I'll show you on this camera. Downstrokes go in, upstrokes come out. On the, low, on the A string, downstrokes go in. Upstrokes come out. It's what we call upstroke escape. The reasons we do it are covered in picking strategies. That's another story for another day. Uh, when you play with a downstroke escape, things you can use are the uh, fingertips to help mute this side of the strings if you need to. You can also use, on the upstroke escape, you can also use a bit more of the karate chop palm for the mute, uh, as opposed to using the thumb side to mute. So if you're playing here, we're doing Zach stuff, for example. <laughs> We can mute with a little bit more palm on here. But another thing to be aware of is to experiment with having what I would probably call a floating anchor or a light floating uh, touch to the guitar where we don't fix ourselves in place, rather we allow ourselves to move around and open up that muting as we go. Now, it can be quite challenging to actually get the downstroke to escape at all. Uh, sorry, to get the note to sound at all if we're using this karate chop mute. There will be a little spot, which is kind of somewhere around here, uh, I'll show you in this camera, somewhere around here on the hand where there's a little bit of area where we can position this knuckle so that we can still mute the strings above it, but create a little tunnel for the string that we're picking on to come out of. I would encourage you to find that and then don't be afraid, like I said, to get these fingers involved in the muting too. It's a very good question, PJ. It's something I struggle with a lot. Uh, those are some tips. Hope that helps. Let me know. Let me know if that's working for you. Uh, so guys, uh, oh, very quickly. Uh, here's a good one. Uh, Daryl uh, Queen says, any scale sequences you suggest for bringing these techniques into those higher speed examples? Ooh, now, if you want to practice this stuff at higher speeds, what I would do is I would work on maybe the idea of playing uh, groupings that don't just start on one string and then move to the next string and stay there. Groupings that bounce between strings. So maybe playing things like groupings of uh, four. So maybe something like this, where we play four notes ascending, we get. Change scales halfway through. Very challenging thing to play, but something like that might work, or groups of three. <laughs> Haven't practiced those enough, but uh, what I might do there is, the reason we do that is because that forces you to uh, to unmute and remute the same string over and over again. But as far as playing this stuff at speed goes, my favorite sequence for this is, um, it's like a six note thing and another six note thing. So I'll show you this very quickly. If we have two strings, let's say we have the low E string and the A string, we would do uh, something that I would call low, middle, high on one string, then the low note on the next string and back down. So that'd be the Paul Gilbert sequence. Then I'd do it again on the way up, low, middle, high, low, high, middle. I'll say that again. Low, middle, high, low, high, middle. And then low, middle, high, low, high, middle. Here's this. Very fun scale sequence. You can apply that to any three note per string position. Um, Apply it to any position, it's gonna sound great. Uh, so that's a cool scale sequence for that. Guys, we've run 11 whole minutes over time. I'm gonna get in trouble for this, right? But uh, I am gonna to have to let you guys go. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, there will be a stream next week. I am not gonna say that I'm going to see you next week. I will see you next week, but well, 
you'll find out. So we're going to get an email out. It's NAM next week, so we'll be out at NAM uh, for the next two Mondays, but there will be streams, 8 p.m. UK time. Uh, I will see you guys there. Whether I'm presenting it, I'm going to leave that to your imagination. But for the time being, that's been a talk on muting. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Nick Jennison, the guitar director of GI+. Plus. I'm really enjoying this 80s back and track, so I'm going to play out on this for a bit. Uh, I will see you guys very, very soon. Take care of yourselves. Happy practicing. Uh, let's do the 80s. <laughs> Just realized, didn't answer this question. A good question. I think yes. I think yes. Right? Hold the chord. Mute everything but the high string. I think yes. So, yeah, anyway, playing. I just want to play mom scene licks now, so I'm going to play some, why not? Um. <laughs> I absolutely never said I could play it. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much guys. My name is Nick Jones, the guitar director of Plus. I will see you next time. My name is Nick Jennison and it's a pleasure to introduce to you GI Plus, the brand new lesson platform brought to you by Guitar Interactive. We've assembled a team of the best players and educators in the world to bring you exclusive lessons covering everything from metal to blues to fusion and everything in between. Want to level up your shred chops? Check out How to Play Fast by Andy James. Or how about Sweet Picking with Rick Graham? Maybe country's more your bag. Well, how about a full-length exclusive country guitar course from Andy Wood? Interested in learning how to play over changes? Well, members get access to hours of exclusive lessons from fusion maestro Tom Quayle. Or maybe you want your playing to sound more soulful. Well, who better than Chris Buck to show you how it's done? Or perhaps you want to learn the secrets of the masters. Well, members get access to over 60 feature-length tech sessions where our tutors painstakingly decode the styles of players like David Gilmour, Eddie Van Halen, John Petrucci, Larry Carlton, Slash, Tosin Abbasi, Paul Gilbert, and many more. You get all this along with exclusive live webinars, free backing tracks, competitions, and so much more. So what are you waiting for? Sign up for GI Plus today.